Hi, I'm Sophie. Welcome to Big Things, Little Things, a podcast series where I sit down with inspiring changemakers to discuss the big things they're doing, the little things that make them who they are, and together we vision pathways towards a better future. Hey guys, this is Sophie. Welcome back to week five of the podcast. It's crazy, it's five weeks already. Um, So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from where I'm speaking today, the Githabal people of the Bunjalung Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Well, welcome everyone. I'm so excited to be here today uh, introducing the guests, Artist as Family, This family, some of you might be familiar with them already, but if you're not, I'll tell you, I guess, how I know of them. So I came across them when I was watching Gardening Australia and they were featured on their property called Tree Elbow in Dalesford, Victoria. So it's um, an urban sized block, a quarter acre block um, that they run, um, I guess, in line with the permaculture um, principles and it's just a beautiful house they have a little um, granny flat kind of house that they can have guest um, farmer workers in to stay there they have so much just um, vegetables and fruit trees and there's so much abundance on the property and yeah it's just they they live a really interesting way of life where they um, they live outside of the monetary economy for the most part so they've really tried to take themselves out of that consumer lifestyle that's really intertwined in the capitalist model oh and one more thing I forgot to mention that they're currently on a bicycle tour that they're doing so they literally just packed up like a backpacking backpack for each of them with all the stuff they need and they go on the road so they're going to go for about a year they've said and they just I think it's just in Victoria um and they are just like riding around on their bikes just going you know where the wind blows them and they don't really use muddy they just try and um, work their way around or like exchange um you know they they'll help people do stuff for, for food and or accommodation and um they'll do a lot of community work um as they progress around the country and um, yeah it's really just a cool way to travel so um, if you're interested in their travels uh, you can find them uh, on their blog Artist as Family if you um, look them up yeah you'll be able to check out their bike tour so enjoy bye where are you calling from we're calling from Gundi Jamara people's country um, in southwest uh, coastal Victoria I've heard you refer to yourselves as neo-peasants And I was wondering if you could explain to the listeners a little bit about what you mean when you describe yourselves as neo-peasants. Yeah, so um, we use the term neo-peasant both in um, cheeky terms and also in more serious terms. And I guess the cheeky uh, aspect is that we're electing to call ourselves peasants from a uh, position of privilege, of education, of um, you know, a couple of generations of being middle class. And, you know, it's, it's a tongue-in-cheek use of the word. But the more serious aspects are the ancestral connections that we're uh, reaching back into. That is with our ancestors who were land-bonded, who had um, close connections to small patches of loved land, who had rituals of return, who had a relationship with commons and community, um, yeah, all the good stuff uh, of the peasantry that is very is not often discussed. Um, the word peasant itself has become a pejorative term. Yeah, no, I, I find it really uh, an interesting way of living and something that intuitively really speaks to me about how you are uh, making that connection with place that I really do feel a lot of modern society has has begun to forget why it's important to have a connection to place. And I was hoping to to ask a little bit about your your story. So 
In terms of your awakening to to the problems in the world, I've heard you speak a little bit about how it was after you both got together when you watched a series of documentaries. I think one of them was about Monsanto. Yes, that's right, The World According to Monsanto. Yes, yeah. So this sort of process of of discovering that the world really didn't or the, the way that society is functioning is not really in a manner that's consistent with you, with our best interests or the nature's best interests and that this was uh, an awakening process that you had after you had to you got together in Dalesford and i was wondering so once you've you'd watched those documentaries and you've said that you went into sort of a grieving process which i can completely relate to because when i uh, became aware of it sort of happened with me becoming aware of the climate crisis, I guess, through similar process where I was listening to a, it was a, an essay being read by Catherine Ingram called An Essay on Extinction, where she tied together the science and the human stories of possible future scenarios that we might encounter. So I listened to that uh, essay one night when I was in bed and it all kind of hit me at, at once where I thought, oh my God. God, <laughs> this huge awakening to, to to how things were. And so when I heard your story about when you watched those documentaries and went into this grieving process, that really resonated with me. I'm really glad that you brought up the grieving, the grief, because it is so essential. And um, somebody asked us yesterday about what, what gives us hope. And I, I really want to touch on the the um, intermarriage of hope with grief because I think people who are aware of what's happening in the world and who have had those moments where they're <laughs> listening to an essay or watching, you know, whatever it is that, that is our, um, our deeper understanding of what's happening in the world, that, you know, part of that process is going into that grief and, yeah, re- really going into it. And as anybody who knows who's had, you know, really full-on traumatic events happen in their past or, you know, big or small, whatever the, those griefs, griefs are, it's really important that we give ourselves permission and allow ourselves to really go deep into the process of grieving for whatever has been lost or whatever has not yet eventuated <clears throat> as we as we thought that it might or as that is our birthright to expect that it might. Mm. That's right. And and what did the grieving process how did that look for both of you because you watched the documentaries together, right? So it was mm-hmm. yep. really a joint process? Yes, it was. Yeah, I mean this this links back to your first question about uh, um, where does neo peasantry come from? Because I, th- I think that when when we become aware of the world and what's going on and what's been taken and what we've lost at a big societal level or in, in a community sense, not just in our personal lives of of loss um, and grief, but actually at the bigger societal level, what um, when when we when we hear um, about what happened to our grandmothers and sisters and mothers in the witch hunts of the Middle Ages, um, as 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 the first really big systemic um, controlling, yeah, top down violence uh, of, of a, it wasn't just an invader. This was actually um, church and state um, turning on its people and basically. Um, mass killing, persecuting, um, throwing out of, build, you know, basically making many women homeless, um, basically uh, through fear campaigns and through propaganda, um, sacrificing or making women, um, particularly death uh, doulas, birth doulas, death doulas, uh, herbalists, midwives, wise women of the town, all of those that were bundled up and labelled witch. Mm -hmm. Um, So these are our ancestral um, mothers and grandmothers and um, daughters and sisters. And and so 
if we don't understand that narrative, um, because we are all sitting with that trauma still in our culture, it's only a few hundred years back that it stopped, maybe 300 years back. I'm not saying that um, peasant societies throughout Europe were, um, you know, hugely egalitarian like we hope for today, but there was um, much more gender distributed culture and that maternal wisdom and paternal wisdom had its place in the village and both were honoured. The peasantry up until the Middle Ages had still an animist um, uh, characteristic in their in their Christianity, and and it was it was accepted and allowed to have that animism, mm-hmm. which and in that animism is an honouring of Mother as Earth, or the maternal um, giving the maternal um, uh, continuity that that basically life resides with the mother, and and that is central. And so the witch hunts were basically paved the way to the Enlightenment, which is basically patriarchal cl- colonialism, which we're still living under um, that that system. So I think when we when we deep dive into our ancestral past, even in more recent ancestral times, like the last 400, 500 years, we see what um, uh, fallen patriarchy has done to our society and continues to do right right now in this moment. Those stories are, if they're secreted, if they're not, they're they're in our body. We we walk with them, with that trauma all the time. We, 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 we are, we are born in, we are made into that trauma. And if we don't go into it, if we don't open to it, um, then, then we don't actually know what's wrong with us we don't actually know what we've come from and therefore we can't actually grieve if you don't know what you're grieving then you can't actually do you can't go you can't grieve properly that's very true i i love hearing you talk about that historical perspective and um the that sort of process of minimizing the feminine in society, especially beginning with those kind of witch hunts and things like that. I, I think that that's a perspective that so many people would never really have been exposed to. You hear about the witch hunts and things like that, but not in that, in that sort of perspective. And we don't often talk about how there is so much residual trauma from all of those historical events that remains to this day. And I am interested in, in, how do you think that humans in this day and age should approach and process that that historical grief that we still hold? Yeah, I just wanted to just also just touch on the word witch because to call somebody a witch is still such a negative term and I think the language needs to be uh, reclaimed as we are trying to do with the word peasant, which also, as Patrick said, is such a pejorative term mm-hmm. and you know, when you're um, make, growing food for your family, Sophie, and saving seeds and when you're making food in your kitchen for your family, there's this alchemical, alchemical magic that happens when you're putting the intention of love into the food and the seeds and the soil. I mean, that is witchcraft. And I yeah. know when I'm fermenting or when I see Patrick kneading um, our bread, our daily bread or feeding our sourdough start off, we're making milk kefir or sauerkraut or pickles or whatever that is, that is the embracing the unknown and the magic of microbes that these days, of course, science tells us what they are, but many, many, many centuries ago or many decades ago, we didn't know what it was. You know, people just thought that it was this magic that happened and, of course, it, it is magic. That's right. We've just sort of lost the. It's it's like something occurring in plain sight that we see so much that we've we just failed to even recognise. I guess the forest for the trees. But it is so true that that intention that you infuse with with the things that you do. Like I notice any time that I last night I sent dinner up to my parents who live nearby, and every time I send food up there, you know, I, I've often used things that I have from my garden to. Um, to add flavour, I'm in no means growing everything that we cook, but I try to, to grow as much as I can. 
And I always have such, you can just feel the response from people when they eat that food that they, it's, it's not just feeding them, it's, it's nourishing some part of them that is almost intangible. And they're always so incredibly appreciative of, of me sharing food and, and hearing the story of the food. So I, I definitely agree that there is this kind of everyday magic that if you look hard enough, you you do see it. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you, one of my questions actually, Meg, was what is your favourite witchy brew <laughs> to make in, in your kitchen? Because I know you have such an amazing um, setup with your fermenting table. And yeah, I was, I was interested to ask you, what's your favourite thing to make at home? Well, we're on the road at the moment. So our witchy brews look pretty different. Um, yeah. But at the moment, uh, three-cornered garlic is in season here and is abundant and do you are you familiar with what that is no I've never heard of that um it's also called onion weed um they're uh the stem of them are a little bit succulent and they're triangular hence the name three-cornered garlic and they have a series of little white uh flowers at the top of them and they like to grow in um at this time of year so here we're approaching um Springtime. <laughs> oh, in spring. It. You're in spring. It's still quite cold here. Um, and it likes to grow in very wet areas, so ditches along roadsides, um, yeah, sort of boggy kind of areas. So you need, do need to be careful where you're harvesting from because if it is by a roadside, then it's going to get the runoff from the road. Um, mm-hmm. But so we've been um, picking that and making a kraut out of that. So just chopping it up really finely and just sprinkling it uh, with salt and just putting in a jar with a, um, a <clears throat> another jar on top of it, um, yeah, just so it makes its own brine and it's ready pretty quickly and it's an allium in the allium family so it is um, a prebiotic as well because it uh, it's very high fibre um, and so you can make a probiotic out of it as well when you ferment it. So that's my, probably my favourite witchy brew at the moment. Awesome. That's so cool. I do love how you really embrace uh, just the, the food that is available to you as you progress through the countryside. I think that that's fantastic. And I, I would love to ask if you could just explain to the listeners the journey that you're on at the moment and how it's going. Yeah, sure. So we left a home about three months ago now in the middle of winter, our first two nights on the road with our bikes, with Woody, our then eight-year-old, now nine-year-old, and our Jack Russell, who's 11, called Zero. And so, yeah, four mammals on two uh, push bikes um, with all our gear, with the tents, with harvesting, hunting, fishing um, equipment, with three food panniers, some clothes, um, basically everything we need. So, yeah, a little caravan uh, of gypsies um on uh on the road for the last three months um and really uh like our our big trip several years ago where we rode from dalesford to cape york listing uh, um, doing many things meeting people um exchanging permaculture skills for um backyards to pitch our tent or you know exchanging food workshops or um a whole range of different things really um and we, we gave uh, weed uh, foraging walks um, to community groups, connecting with community gardeners and permaculturalists and, and just about a whole range of different people, bikies and um, cattle people. And, um, yeah, these little trips have become, or not little because <clears throat> that was a year or 14 months, that last one, and this is going to be a year as well. They're, they're every now and again just to sort of shake our comfort. Um, it's We call it a pilgrimage, so <clears throat> it's our bicycle pilgrimage. And um, we're just learning, yeah, just being sort of back into that lovely naive place that you are when you leave home where, you know, you have at home this intimate connection, this knowing, this community, this support, this safety. There's all these beautiful, wonderful things that you build up over, over a, a life. Um, but to go on to the road um, smashes all that apart and that's really exciting because it, it puts us in a vulnerable place in order to learn and to to get our, or to, to really, um, if we're in right relation um, with, with country and with the communities that we come across, um, 
we uh, have we receive gifts of, of, of knowledges and understandings that we can then take home to our own community. And just just on that, um, you know, back back home, I wanted just to pick up something we were talking about before. Meg and I have been running um, uh, circles in the forest, um, uh, like grief circles with community members and several, um, yeah, they can be 12 people to 20 people um, around a fire in the forest. And um, basically that's a place for, uh, because I think there's m- many opportunities. People grieve in either family groups or ind- individually. Um, yep. Whereas uh, with the big societal stuff that we also need to, sh- to share, it, doing grieving publicly is something that we don't really do much in our culture. So, um, and maybe that's the sort of, that's where um, f- more formal religion played a role um, up until recently. But um, in terms of just having... Um, places to uh, where where there is um, just lightly facilitated um, circles where there isn't anyone dominating the conversation. Um, people speak and no one interrupts, um, and it's an opportunity to, to have. There's a set of protocols which I won't go into here, but um, yeah, there there are gifts that come into that circle. So when someone opens up and tells their story, it, 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 it is a gift back into it, uh, into that circle. And that can have profound, um, uh, consequences in the, in the, in the, um, in the community. And, and I think it just enables us to, uh, be able to be deep listeners in the world. Um, we, we always start those circles by listening to the forest for 15, 20 minutes and we go off into individual sit spots and then we come back to the, the forest and then we, sh- we share. I'm so, I love these circles that you, you run and I love that idea of, of just connecting with other human beings and processing those deeper emotions that we just silence these days to our detriment and the detriment of the world around us. And I just uh, always, I always, when I hear you talk about the community work that you do in Dalesford, that I think, oh, I just wish that I lived closer because I would just love to be able to be part of something like that. And, um, you know, I I think the next best thing is is for me to try to facilitate something like that in my own community because I I have started a group here where um, I'm trying to establish a system for trading and bartering food like you do because I know that you have a large network of families that you um, exchange food and services with and um, that's a big part of you living outside of the monetary economy. So I'm in the very beginning phases of that. But just, um, yeah, sort of going back to the the question that we were at before about um, the historical trauma that um, we have experienced and uh, how how do you think we we could deal with that kind of um, trauma and grief in this modern day and age to process that and move through that so that we're not constantly repeating those vicious cycles and maybe moving into a, a new place where we can we can have, free up that energy so that we can live in a new way to really be good at anger and that's one of the things that I learned from my relationship with Patrick. Um, this is my longest relationship by a long shot before Patrick my longest relationship was about six months or to a year because every time I had an argument with a boyfriend I was out of there but I learned with Patrick how to fight in a really healthy way and how to argue and sort of to work through things and I think there has to be room for rage in this culture and in this society there's so much injustice and there's so much privileging of that (laughs) unjustness um, over what our hearts know mm. is right and true. And so we're not caught up in this the rage and the anger and so it doesn't get out of balance. We need to also work out how to process that in in a really profound ways. Um, so we're not, you know, Patrick and I have both been activists, we've been at blockades, 
we've written letters, we've we've banged our heads against the, <laughs> the gates of parliament and that, that work is really, really important. But for us, it also makes sense to work towards creating the world that we do want to see and there's, you know, that whole be the change and working towards creating that change um, is definitely where permaculture comes in. And I really like one of the things that I've heard you say a few times, Patrick, is about permaculture being a way for second peoples to move back into more of a a mindset and a way of being and belonging that traditionally first peoples have been brought up Mm. brought up with yeah yeah Yeah. I, i i think i just wanted to make a little comment that that that's very uh insightful and a very simple thing that uh patrick said before that we need to sit with our discomfort and vulnerability, which I think in our modern day people spend a lot of time and energy trying to run away from those feelings and to distract themselves from those feelings. And I I definitely have been very guilty of that through many different mediums, I guess, using TV, using music, using any means of distraction, alcohol, drugs, Um, you know, you try to suppress these feelings. But really to to move past those feelings, you have to sit with them. So it's really just putting off that moment, that that discomfort. How long do you want to put it off for? And so I think it is so true that we do just need to sometimes feel really terrible and yucky and angry and sad. Mm-hmm. And and I think a, a really interesting part of my journey since I did listen to that essay with Catherine Ingram was that it's it I've described it like it it flicked on the light switch mm-hmm. to see things in a different way. And one of the things that it has done to me is it's made me very um, sensitive to to emotions and feelings mm-hmm. and. Yeah, I I think I'm much more sensitive to a lot of the injustices in the world these days and I I don't know exactly how to explain it but I just feel like I I feel everything so deeply since I Mm. had that moment of awakening and, yeah, I think it's really important for humans these days to learn to just sit with that discomfort. So thank you for (laughs) And I I think to add to that too is that becoming um, conscious is is about being aware of the 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 stories our minds are telling us and the the negativity that um that is so prevalent in our in our in our ego speaking to us like if we if we become aware of that voice talking to us saying no I, i'm not very good or you know that that person's not very good or just the the judgmental nature is the trauma what we tell ourselves keeps the grief in an unproductive festering place and I think this is the power of things like meditation and breath work which we've been really turning to Um, and being aware of our thoughts you know just becoming aware of wow I'm in a really negative place at the moment or wow I'm I'm actually um, I, I haven't been having my mind speaking negativity at me for for several days now how 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 freeing is that you know yes. whatever it wherever it is but i think yeah that turning to drugs and alcohol particularly as young people is the stories we're telling ourselves and we have a society that that basically amplifies that trauma that's a long-term societal trauma by things like instagram and snapchat and all the things that um are constantly holding a mirror to us um, as a kind of young Dorian Grays who uh, need to be seen in a particular way, need to be seen as attractive, as capable, as okay, as funny, uh, um, entertaining, um, and certainly, yeah, the secretion of actually what's going on are much more holistic because all those things may may exist, but... Um, there's a whole lot of other things that are going down with all of us at the moment. And, you know, particularly in this time of COVID um, and so much fear and so much worry, the antidote to that is to stare at a leaf, really, to go, Mm. to go for a walk and to behold birdsong Mm. and to, to breathe into the world as lungs of the world to actually absorb, 
to take in the world and to uh, being oxygen and to give back to the world, world being carbon dioxide and 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 to to just get back to sort of simple um, rituals of um, connectivity that we are a part of this world we are not separate we are not bodies of um, bodies to be manipulated and controlled we are we are free people of this world who have responsibilities uh, to the well-being of our communities and and to to the world to the to, to the earth. We're all so beautifully interconnected that part of what we need to do is, is sit with ourselves and, and contemplate, just contemplate life and how things are. What if? Because we have so much power to envision these different futures. Well, I guess it's that's the thing, the reconnection with the leaf is the reconnection with our food, which is the reconnection with our soil, which is the reconnection with our, the, the sunlight, which is universal, but it falls in, in our little patch of the world wherever we are or the rain that comes or the winds that blow in, that these are the, and, and of course the, our neighbours and community around us. So these are, these are the tangible relational possibilities that we have. And the bigger, um, the bigger we're, we're in this problematic dilemma of globalism and the corporatization of globalism. So this sort of utopian ideal of the, of the global village um, has long gone and we're left with um, large corporate forces um, wishing to, you know, grow our food in a particular way, give our medicine in a particular way, provide us with energy in a particular way and basically data mine us for all the technology that we use and, and manipulate us through algorithms and, these are these are things that we can get very anxious ridden about as small community groups are being usurped. Um, things are being done on our behalf that we haven't given permission for. Sometimes it takes a cataclysmic change to to force the system to break mm. so that that energy can be released and then change in its form yeah. so that we're living a different life. So it's perhaps it it won't change the economic system until there is some kind of terrible yeah. event. I mean, maybe the pandemic is part of that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But yeah. Di- didn't we all think when COVID first started that things would be radically changed? And I yeah. don't mean in the way that they have changed, but I just saw that, you know, the interest in artists' as families' work and many other permaculture um, practitioners, just the interest in permaculture and the interest in self and community sufficiency was just skyrocketing because people were at home, people were scared, people saw how vulnerable. Saw empty shelves in supermarkets. Yeah, and people, yeah. the supply chains were were broken and people were and very. S- still are. Yeah, and people were very fearful for good reason. But now I think people things have shifted, maybe not for everybody, but for a lot of people things have shifted and they just want things to go back to normal and how they were because, as you say, you know, that's, there's definitely safety in that and people are afraid of making big changes. But I also think we need to mm. keep in perspective that the pandemic is an obsession with ourselves because mm. it is anthropogenic. It is all about the people. I mean, why... why a world governments and policymakers making these great changes to save lives when whole ecosystems yeah. are collapsing. Yeah. yeah. They're not about humans, but this is about humans. So we also need to keep that into perspective. So I, I feel like there's this um, such opportunity. I, I mean, many people do, like, like we've been really given a lot of grief, but also a lot of insight into what's possible mm. and um but fear is it will always dis enable uh, any kind of um productive movement or any kind of um renewal i mean it it, it began as a colonial project the um the the the, the 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 economic system and it still is i mean this is why we're friends with degrowth activists and why degrowth is so important because well, we the, are degrowth activists. exactly <laughs> mm-hmm. but um 
why why we yeah we've made relationships with that movement is because it fits so beautifully into permaculture be, because it's staged it's rather than collapse just holding on to this dinosaur of a mm. economic way of being it's a it's staged um decline so which is what we've been doing in, in a household and community context for the last 15 years and and it's you know we've become freer less anxious more in life more in love with the world more generous having much more to share um because of that staging my active hope is is trying to spread these messages to to people through this this podcast and and telling the stories of people like yourself that there is a new way and it may seem as though things are terrible and we're living in this fear-driven world and to some degree we are at the moment but we just need to to keep connecting in our communities mm-hmm. to each other and mm-hmm. and to rebuild that that village that we have lost yeah because that's where our strength lies. And I said this to Hannah Maloney when I spoke to her a few days ago. What we have above the mainstream media and the politicians is we have the numbers. So it's really just staying strong and spreading our message. Mm. And and I think, yes, like th- there will at some point be some form of collapse, but, you know, <laughs> we can meet it. <laughs> things, things will look different in the future. Our land where we live is different to the land that you live on, is different to the land that we're currently on. And all the communities are different on those pieces of unceded sacred land. It's that we're all expressing, it's all about diversity. And before, you, when you said, uh, Sophie, that we have the numbers, and we have, we, it, we're, as individuals and as individual communities, we're going to respond differently to what is happening on our land and to what is happening in the world. We're going to respond in our own unique ways and I think that has been so lost those nuances of individual responses and individual um uh or small scale responses yeah exactly community neighborhood sense exactly but this whole economic system is trying to push us into one way of living the expert's way yeah and there's, (laughs) there's there's one solution to one problem and we all know that that's not possible, that there isn't just one way of being in this world. Mm. And I feel like that's one of the most beautiful things of, of, of travelling and, you know, these kinds of generative conversations like we're having with you is about sharing stories and listening to people because when you're sharing stories with people, there are so many different responses that people are having. Mm. That's right. Yeah, but I, I did, this is, it's sort of related, but it, it is a change in gears slightly because it's about this one wayism. And um, I did really want to ask Meg um, in particular. <laughs> so the way that you live is is definitely outside of the mainstream um, since you've been together and, and embrace, embrace this neo-peasant lifestyle. And I hope it's not too personal to ask, but I was wondering how you approached um birthing as a mother uh, from your neo-peasant perspective? Mm -hmm. Well, um, great question. Thank you. I know it's a very intimate question and I ask this because I I have, um, I guess, I had a home birth for my second daughter and um, that experience was very transformative. So that's why I'm just interested in your perspective as a woman and how how maybe birth, how the experience was for you and and whether that shaped the person that you are today. Um, Well, I feel like even before the birth, um, just in terms of pregnancy and even just before, even before pregnancy, so when Patrick and I, um, and I guess my hesitation is which part do I go back to? Um, So when Patrick and I got together, uh, Patrick had had a vasectomy um, and the first night uh, we were, one of the first nights we were together, Patrick said, um, (laughs) I want to be with you, and if it, you know, if you want me to have it reversed, then I will. <laughs> and I thought, oh, what? Too much, too soon. But of course, we had great foresight. Yeah. Um, so, Patrick, uh, we decided after many years that um, we would like to have a baby together. And so, Patrick had his vasectomy reversed. Um, so that was, you know, really wanting to um, 
live um, a very connected and natural life but also needing to have this intervention to undo a previous intervention um, um, so that was clearly a success because uh, we had Woody um, but before we had Woody I had three um, miscarriages and they were really big um, but I knew that it was kind of practice and I knew that my body was preparing for a full pregnancy so although I was devastated and there was much grief miscarriages occur in many mammals so I knew that I was in good company Um, and the pregnancy itself uh, was just this very beautiful very magical time of feeling really part of the world and of course you don't have to go through pregnancy to to feel that but for me that was really essential all the feelings were essential, just this being connected and looking at flowers and buds and fruit and just thinking, well, that's just me and really I'm just a pine cone, you know, <laughs> having babies and leaving my – having seeds. Um, and, yeah, the, the, we had aimed to have – really, really wanted to have a home birth. We had the birth pool set up at home but after three days of labour um, we tried to – we were taken to hospital uh, with our midwife and – uh, tried to labour there. Yeah, so we had ended up having um, a Caesar. Um, well, I guess it was emergency. It was unplanned and unwanted but, um, yeah, very much mm-hmm. glad that that's been part of our story and we mm-hmm. tell it to Woody in that, you know, he was a big baby and really tried to uh, to push him out naturally and that didn't happen so the doctor came and he took his sword and he cut Woody out of my, st- <laughs> out of my womb um, and... And this is where Western medicine is fantastic. Exactly. In those, in those moments, it's so good. Yeah, and I'm yeah. yeah incredibly grateful that we live in a country where we I didn't have to go in debt for the rest of my life to to pay for this birth. But uh, then we also, as soon as the birth happened, and that wonderful moment of Western medicine, just just beautiful people, just smart, intelligent, doing this incredible work, um, and then um, and then this sort of barrage of you need to be these antibiotics you need this you need that you need just the obsession and the fear-mongering around all this stuff that is was completely not so we had to get out of there really quickly and so <clears throat> um at that time patrick was doing his doctorate and um was really wonderful because he had three months paid paternity leave um so to have him at home to help it was just after we got home after being in hospital it was just this really beautiful time of being in our garden and um and also patrick and woody share a birthday so woody was born on patrick's birthday and which is at the end oh wow end of august so it's really the sort of end of winter the beginning beginnings of spring it was a very magical time and also and i say this to any of the parents uh out there or parents to be um to really look up um the dunstan baby language which is uh, a language that you can uh, understand what your baby is saying. So it's it's only um, applicable from birth to three months, mm-hmm. um, and I won't I won't go into it now. But it's really incredible. So Dunstan baby language. There's five. I just wrote that down. Yeah. That's I've never heard of that, and that's very interesting. I wish I had known about that. There's five sounds, and they all um, equate to a need. Um, and they're based on different reflexes that the baby yeah. makes. So I'll just, just tell you a couple of them quickly. So there's nya, 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 which is based on the sucking reflex. So that means that your baby is hungry. There's eh, eh, which is upper wind, and eh, eh, which is lower wind. So if you can hear that the upper wind, then you don't want it to get to the lower wind because that's much more difficult to, to settle your baby when they've got lower wind. Mm. But why aren't we told this? Why don't we know this? Even our independent midwife, the, all the midwives in the hospital, the doctors, the nurses, the obstetricians, nobody has this information. Is it because it was held with our great-great-grandmothers, you know, in the time of the witch hunts and this this is um, that was killed off with them? But what else? have we lost Mm. and I think these sorts of bringing this knowledge back into into the present tense is really vital Mm. Uh, I think yeah it's so I I find the whole childbirth experience just very interesting and it really ties back to our discussion of the 
the witch hunts and yeah, things absolutely. in the beginning of the conversation. Yeah, because I don't think that there is one, you know, right way to birth for, for everyone. And I'm also extremely grateful for, for modern medicine. And there are definitely times when that's absolutely essential. Yeah. But I definitely recognize that something that has been taken from women is is trust oh, you know absolutely. when we're not allowed to trust our bodies yeah. we're the only animal that i know that we don't think that we can birth a baby yeah. and sometimes we can't but you know we we can in a lot of instances and i think that just a really important thing moving forward is is to start to to encourage women to to lean in and trust their body and trust their instincts with having babies and, and raising babies because there's so much wisdom that, that we're disconnected from. And I think that's for anybody alive at the moment. I mean, this is another thing with the one dominant story that our governments are shoving down our necks is that we're not allowed to have that sovereignty over our own bodies. We're not allowed to make those decisions for ourselves. And that one wayism is inherently patriarchal. I would I would argue yes. that it's it doesn't allow for nuance and and um, and yes the trust thing. If trust was restored back to women in that case in in the case of birth, but trust generally, if people were um, basically told st- stop being told that you know stop listening to yourself, trust an expert. The expert knows the science is correct. Well, that's just nonsense. I mean, most much of the time, the science is a process, like anything. And most good scientists will recognize, recognize that in their field, it's a process of inquiry and understanding and knowledge accruement. And it, and this is just those words that you said, Patrick, are exactly the reason why we've decided to uh, not send Woody to school because it's the it's the trusting his own intuition. It's learning who he is, and it's not top down. We we're part of what we call um, partnership parenting with Woody, and it's not it's really trying to not be top down and not tell him what he should be learning and what is important to him. It's really letting him unfold, and, and because we. It's we can't just say, okay, women, you're on your own now. Now give birth because it starts. Yeah. You know, it starts as children mm. because they have to not be severed from those lines of intuition. Mm. And how do we help them trust themselves? We have mm. to give them that trust. We have to show them what it looks like. Mm. Yes, I the homeschooling journey that you're on is is very interesting to me. I um, my girls are one and two and a half, so they're not quite at that point yet. But we um. We've been talking about it recently and, and I'm definitely feeling a real draw towards the the homeschooling and unschooling. And so I, yeah, it's interesting to hear you talk about that and um, how is Woody finding that now? What does a, a day look like for him in terms of his learning? Now, obviously it's different every day probably but. <laughs> yeah, so he has areas of um, where he's just really inclined uh, and then others with, that he's like music where he's chosen to play, say, the fiddle, and cho- and he loves music, um, but the uh, the inclination to play um, is, you know, comes and goes, whereas something like building or fishing or hunting is just his, um, that, there he is where he wants to be. And so that, you know, in many respects this year away has been about just, getting out on the road and developing particularly his hunting and fishing and foraging skills. Um, so, and, you know, the other thing, I guess, about providing this as a basis for education uh, of which history and mathematics and literature and Geography. S- story, yeah, story and everything feeds into. That's the thing, that if a child is excited and, and a passionate learner, they will absorb so much more so much more quickly and then they through that um that one interest or two interests or three interests everything else can be fed in as a, as a potential learner so you in in many respects unschooling is um setting up good frameworks for that sort of um self-directed learning whereas but you the parent doesn't have to be the educator in in that sort of traditional sense and i think a lot of people are put off by homeschooling because oh you know i've got to be a teacher 
It's like yes. that's not the point at all. The children teach themselves. If, if you have a look at um, uh, Professor Peter Gray's work, he um, wrote a book called uh, Free, to Learn. Free to Learn, and he's an evolutionary biologist who's particularly looking at um, how mammals learn. And how mammals play and learn through play. And Yeah, and how <laughs> modern <laughs> schooling basically just takes more and more play out of the equation and puts kids inside usually on chairs usually in front of screens <laughs> and so yeah. this this is sort of like you know it, it has the obvious health effects of anxiety of um sedentism the you know of not being fully in your body which then limits your trust of yourself and your capabilities there's just the on on effects of because at school, mm. well, traditionally school, you know, the schools at the moment that we see, especially in this country, are, again, a product of that one wayism, that there's one curricula, curriculum, there's, mm. you know, one, one end goal, which is to get everything right on a test, which is yeah. really anti-life. And also very competitive and, and I, again, I'd argue patriarchal. It, it's mm-hmm. not gender distributed. It's the, that while... A, you know, probably more women work in the education system than men, I, I would say it is an inherently patriarchal system still. And That's right. Yeah, also I, I 100% agree with you, but I think we need to make the distinction, and we've talked about this before, Patrick, uh, about toxic patriarchy and patriarchy mm, because I sure. think patriarchy is welcome and is important but it's when it gets out of balance and it becomes toxic that's when i think the issues or or in the absence of um anything else that's that's its problem patriarchy is absolutely toxic in the absence of of distributed power yeah Mm. i I think it's a the whole um, discussion surrounding um, femininity and masculinity and or whatever terms you'd like to Mm. use um i i find that very, very interesting. And, and I do, this is, I'm not, you know, super well versed in this area. This is just me speaking from like from the heart, but how I feel, I definitely agree that it seems to be an extremely, um, there seems to be a dense masculinity in our culture at the moment. Mm. And just from my experience, you know, that, that feminine energy, that's the life bringer and Mm. the, the current state of the world, it does really, we, we are crushing crushing the life out of things. So it is, I think, part of the way forward is is trying to to re-embrace that femininity mm. that has been so oppressed for so long. Mm-hmm. And it's it's how to do that. I'm I'm still kind of grappling with that and I, I don't know. But that's I think talking talking about these problems and I don't know if you have any insight on how we might restore the balance with the that feminine masculine um, in society I'd, I'd be interested to hear it yeah well when we have um house and garden tours at our house Patrick usually does the outside and then if people come inside for the and I give them the tour of the inside of the house and I always start by saying a woman's place is in the home and a man's place is in the home too and Sophie I know that you're reading radical homemakers at the moment Yes, and I wanted to read it before our interview, but because we moved, um, we moved the interview up. I haven't finished it yet, but I'm loving it. And for me, that book holds a lot of the answers about our way back to gender distribu- distribution, because it talks about how, especially in the first half of the book, how it was the men's relationship to that sacred home place that was severed first when they were sent down the mines and sent into factories and then the women were at home left to do all the work which was then made very meaningless when they had machines which to do the work which separated them from doing these beautiful labours of love that were, were part of their, you know, making the food and growing the food and their connection to place and their connection to family and community which was was severed so I think for us a a return a big part of our return journey home and reclamation of these processes has been to go slowly and to give ourselves permission to go slowly in in our journey of growing food and restoring community bonds that's right and and that that book is so I guess 
you know, the concepts that they're quite, quite practical and quite simple, but just that returning to, to the home as the base and, and finding that connection in the home to the bigger picture is, is actually so radical, Yeah, but so simple. (laughs) It's, uh, it's like the, it's such an obvious solution, but people, so obvious that it's overlooked. And also too, because there are two types of feminism that I see that there's one is that a woman's place is is in the home and to give that status because there is great power and great responsibility in feeding yourself and nourishing your family and community, whereas we're told as women throughout our industrial schooling that we need to, you know, put on power suits and, you know, be in government or be CEOs or work outside the home place and that's where we're going to get power and that's where we're going to be seen in the world for who we truly are and that's where we can express our gifts and anything else is just not important. So I call that empire feminism. I know when my uh, grandmother was still alive, I looked down on her because she was a housewife but I didn't see what an empowering thing that 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 is. That's right. Yes, I, I exactly the same. And now I just you look at things with a different lens as you learn. Yes, and and unlearn. It's a, yeah. <laughs> a lot and unlearn. Yeah. That's right. It it really is a process of unlearning mm-hmm. everything that we have been taught. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and equally for me, um, who's the 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 so called. Um, mold that I should have fitted into Mm. is the big earner and someone who has a job in the real world yeah yeah as we like to say Meg is is the breadwinner she works two days a week I'm the bread maker um there are many traditional gender roles and there are many complete you know I'm the sewer I'm the knitter I'm I'm kind of the house proud person um in many ways. What are you saying? <laughs> I'm so proud of our house. You're slacking, Meg, you're slacking. <laughs> I'm proud of but the I'm, house that I'm, Tatsu I'm has created. I'm the new dude. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's lots of there's lots of uh things that we've I mean I I studied feminist um, theory at university and um, I've always called myself a feminist. I've I've written a feminist text called Refermenting Culture. Um, but I'm also a masculinist, and I feel like in this world of um, of toxic patriarchy, whether you're male or female or someone who identifies as other, if you have hate, hatred in yourself, ideological hatred, you are a product of patriarchal to- uh, toxic patriarchy. Mm. Basically, mm. It doesn't matter whether you're a feminist or a misogynist or a misandrist or a, a green person or a a blue man or whatever you are, you you know, that, that hatred is the trauma within us all. Mm. And it's, Mm. it's come through toxic patriarchy. It's come through oppression. It's come through control. Um, That's right. And, and it's, it's like you said earlier, it's just returning to, to that comment, just that hatred is, is the trauma and it's recognizing that and sitting with it. (laughs) So it's really fair enough to be angry. It's just, how, how do we develop, uh, how do we el- enable our anger as a, a legitimate uh, uh, emotion to, 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 to what we've inherited, what we've been made into? How do we process that so we don't then pass it on to the next generation? Yes, that's right. So our yeah. anger isn't put as a wound, as it so often is, mm. a wound into somebody else, that our anger can be expressed without judging or wounding or harming other people. That's that's something that I I find like you know, that's a life's work that that I I personally need to work on that, um, and I think I think that's probably common for many people. Mm. Mm. Well, I think I think that's a a really poignant uh, probably place to to stop the discussion now. Um, mm. I think we have touched on so many big topics, but I've loved mm. having this conversation with you and just hearing your your insights and I I love the way that you live your life and and your constant I think your commitment to to learning constantly learning and educating yourselves is is so impressive Thanks. and I really um yeah admire and and strive to to embody some of the things that you you do because I think it's it's really it's awesome one little comment I'll make before you do um end is that um I think I think I heard you talking about the importance of the campfire, you know, and sitting around the campfire yeah. to discuss and process emotions. And I have actually heard somebody 
comment recently that that podcasting is the new campfire. Yeah, yes. digital campfire. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And I I definitely think so because even though it is kind of using these systems that, that mm. you know kind of shit in a lot of ways, mm. but mm. but uh, I the but personal growth that I've experienced through listening to people mm. just have these in depth discussions through podcasting has been so pivotal in my life. Absolutely. So yeah. Um, well, I'll let you guys continue on your your wonderful journey and I really hope that one day I can meet you in person and yeah. give you a hug and mm. hang out because so there you have it guys that was our discussion I hope you enjoyed it